So um, my name is Awista Yub. I'm director of the fellows program here at New America. Um, thank you for joining us for this conversation as Zwayne launches his new book into the world today, which is actually New York Times reviewed. Um, this is um, one of our 20th anniversary series events. New America is celebrating its 20th year this year. We were founded in 1999 um, as a civic platform that really engaged with new ideas and helping um, amazing writers like Clint and Dwayne um, publish books was one idea that came up during those radical uh, first few years. And 20 years later, we've helped support over 200 fellows who've published over 116 books. Actually, I think 116 is yours, mm -hmm. um, nine films, and also several um, award-winning books as well in our first Pulitzer this year. So what was once um, probably just considered a radical, crazy idea is actually proven to be very successful 20 years later. So with that, um, I will transition the conversation over to Dwayne and Clint. Um, I will give a quick introduction um, of each, and then um, I'll sh transition over to Dwayne, who will actually open with a poetry reading from his new book. Um, Dwayne Betts is a class of 2018 Emerson Fellow here at New America. He is now the author of four books with the publication of his newest book today, and, and including the 2015 collection of poems, Bastards of the Reagan Era. He's a graduate of the Yale Law School, and he's received fellowships from the Soros Foundation, Penn America, and the Poetry Foundation at the Radcliffe um, Institute of Advanced Studies. Joining him today uh, to moderate the conversation is Clint Smith. Clint is actually one of just our newly accepted class of 2020 Emerson Fellows, and he's com completing a book on how the word is passed, a narrative nonfiction project that explores the relationship between place and public history, in which he travels to different sites throughout the country, examining how each of them reckon with or fail to reckon with the relationship to the history of slavery and Jim, Grow, and Jim Crow. Um, his book will be published by Little Brown in the next year or two. Um, he's also a prolific poet, so it's an amazing opportunity to have uh, two very dynamic writers who just know how to bring words together in ways that are both beautiful, articulate, and also very informed. So with that, uh, Clint, the conversation yours. Or actually, Dwayne, yeah, did you want to start sorry, with the poetry sorry. reading? Can I get a book? Yeah. <laughs> I cannot get a, I think I changed it. Okay. A lot. We'll get you a hardcover. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm going to read, Can, yeah, if we pass a book, then I promise to read from it. Um, thank you guys for coming. This is a lot of people. This is, I didn't know it was going to be this many people there. Neither did Aristotle, who was like, I'm coming today because it's raining and ain't nobody coming to hear you in the rain. <laughs> I was like, I don't know, man, I'm kind of decent. He's like, nah, you know. Um, so I'm going to read a few. We do have copies of the book on deck as well. I'm gonna read the first poem and I'm gonna tell you about it just so that, um, so what I'm gonna try to do is I'm gonna read some poems that's thematically connected. And I'm gonna read the first poem, it's called Guzzle. And, um, and this poem is, is, is a Persian, sort of uh, Persian form. And the thing that you should listen for is the poem is each, so the first couplet is all, it's written in couplets. And the idea is that each couplet is like a pearl on a string of pearls. And so it's a part of a unit, but it's also its own thing. And in the first couplet, it has a line that repeats, a phrase that repeats at the end of each line, and it's after prison. And then in each subsequent couplet, before you hear the phrase after prison, you'll hear a word that, that's rhyming. So in this case, it'll be suspect, expect, dialect, and the idea is that that's just the form. And, and, and the notion is how do you use structure to circle a theme or a topic? None of that was relevant, but sometimes it's cool to know stuff like that. Oh, the other thing that is relevant is that you sign your name in the last couple. Guzzle. Name a song that tells a man what to expect after prison. Explains Occam's razor. You're still a suspect after prison. Titus Gaffar painted my portrait, then dipped it in black tar. He knows redaction is a dialect after prison. From inside a cell, the night sky isn't the measure. That's why it's prison's vastness your eyes reflect after prison. My lover don't believe in my sadness. She says whiskey not time is what left me wrecked after prison. Ruth, paper maker, take these tattered gray sweats. Make paper of my bed. A past I won't reject after prison. The state murdered Khalif with a single high bail. Always innocent. Did he fear time's effect after prison? 
Dear Warden, my time been served, let me go. Promise that some of this I won't recollect after prison. My mother has died, my father, a brother, and two cousins. There is no God, no reason to genuflect after prison. Jeremy and Forrest rejected the template, said for it to be funky, the font must redact after prison. Now, the reason why that couplet is really cool is because I broke the rules of the, of the thing, too. Because if you notice, redact doesn't actually rhyme with reflect and all of the other ones. And so I was like, Jeremy and Forrest rejected the template while I was also in the very phrase rejecting the template. That didn't matter, but I just wanted to tell you. <laughs> and so since I broke up the poem, I'll tell you one other thing. Um, so this poem also was like a guide to a project that me and my friend Titus Kafar did. And so the line, so what I did is I was like an old school rapper that shouts out all his friends. So Titus Kafar, we did this, he, he create, painted a portrait of me and we did this series of prints. And so that refers to that, but we also got um, I bought a whole bunch of towels from prison that was made by prisoners in Virginia. And I also got my homeboys to send me their clothes. It was like their sweats and shit that they had been wearing for decades. And they sent it to us and we made paper out of it. So when I say Ruth, paper maker, take these tattered gray sweats, make paper of my bed, a past I won't reject after prison. It's actually literal. And, uh, and Jeremy and Forrest, we created a font for the project. So when I say they rejected the template, they rejected the existing fonts and they created their own font for the project. And it was like for them to make it funky, the font must redact. And actually like the, the font, we redact spaces in the font. That's like the feature of the font. The font is featured within a book, but you can only see it. You can only see some of the distinctions when it's blown up. Anyway, he came home saying righteous coochie and jive turkey. All them lost years, his slings architect after prison. The printer silk screens a world onto black paper. With ink, Eric reveals that we, Eric reveals what we neglect after prison. My homeboy says he's done with all that prison shit. His wife and baby girl gave him love to protect after prison. And then them fools say, you can become anything when it's over. Told him straight up, ain't nothing to resurrect after prison. You have come so far, beloved. And for what? Another song? Then sing, Shaheed, you loved, not shipwrecked after prison. Hmm. I like clapping after coins. <laughs> <laughs> that is dope. I personally like throwing money at people after coins. <laughs> I just, you know, they do it at church. You know what I mean? So whiskey for breakfast. My liver, a wash in all but dregs of a charred oak cask, soap in Bali's amber, shadow that's blood dim as a cell in the hole. Survive brackish prison water only to become collateral. The things that haunt me still drown now, friends say, and nearly 50 pounds of brick hue rock gut. Spiritus frumenta, a gallon of whiskey weighs eight pounds. And all this becomes a man confessing that he's riven, and I drink. Mornings, I turn sunrise into another empty glass, and a dozen angels diving behind the mire, I swallow to save my body from itself. All scream, me and even the cherubim lost in that smoky, dense comfort, lost in darkness. And sometimes, I swear, even God has no alibi. Mm -hmm. I'm read a couple more. Um, I'm gonna read some, some that I think are, uh, so maybe we'll talk about this, but I just wanna say this, y'all get the book, y'all might get the book, y'all read the book. It's like one of the things about being a poet is um, this is really hard to be a poet and not turn your poetry into a dating ad. No, no, because yeah, like, it's like what happens is when you reveal your flaws, you reveal your flaws that you have like carefully manicured to show something about yourself that you're sensitive, that you're righteous, or you are sensitive, you are righteous, you are employed, 
You aren't an abuser. You haven't assaulted anybody. But if you want to write about incarceration, if you want to write about the lives of black men, if you only write about the things that you have experienced, oh, what's going on, man? You made it. Um, he was mad at me a few weeks ago because I was supposed to go clamming with him, right? And then I told him three minutes before we were supposed to go get on the boat that I wasn't going to make it. That was really bad form. Now, if I wanted to really show you the kind of person I am, I would put that in a poem. <laughs> but because that makes me horrible, I'm never going to say anything like that publicly, right? <laughs> but anyway, so I wrote these poems, and they're all in the first person. And it's because I want to be, if I want to be, people say shit like the people that's closest to the problem are closest to the solution. I don't know if that's true. Sometimes if you're closest to the problem, you're just closest to the problem. But I wanted to write about what it means to be close to problems and be close to problems that you won't, don't want to talk about. So. Um, some of the stuff is like rough, and I'm gonna read a few of these, and then me and Clinton talk. Me and Clinton talk. Night. In the night, night of sleep, her eyes, woman, my woman, I name her as if she is mine, as if these hours that pass for the night belong to us. My nights belong to the memories I can't shake. My night and this woman, my woman, she tells me how it wasn't supposed to be like this. This insight, another Hail Mary, another haymaker. We live somewhere between almost there and not enough. Almost there. Her dreams and all that she lost for me is a kind of accounting. My woman, not my woman, not this night, not these nights. The mind is less mine, more hurt, more hover than anything else. Shadow cloud, or as she says it, you stalk me until I submit it. Love shapes itself into my hands wrapped around her throat. Have you loved like that? I'll call your PO. It's the thing she says on this night with the men I robbed still lingering. A threat to the freedom I imagined she gave when we became cliche. Naked, tangled. This is always about me. How violence called to me like my woman moans when she thought all this was the promise of more than a funeral. When I grabbed her like that the first time, her legs held me tight. My woman thinking the cells in my past can make her control this. All the ways I starve. She threatens to call my history back as a constraint or madness. She stared at me once and said she saw her brothers doing life in my eyes. And this night when we talk to each other, it is in shouts. The quilt of solitary cells I've known confess that my woman has never been my woman. How ownership and want made me split that bastard's head into a stream is what I'll never admit. What she tells me, prison killed you, my love. Killed you so dead that you're not here now. You're never here. You're always. Her eyes closed at night and I awaken and swear she stares at me. She is saying that brown liquor owns me, saying that the cells own me, and that there is no room for her unless she calls the police, the state, calls upon her pistol, and sets me free. Mm. Yeah. So I read two more, and then, and then we'll shut it down. I'm going to read this one because I like the title. On voting for Barack Obama in a Nat Turner t-shirt. This is actually about me. The ballot ain't never been a measure of forgiveness. In prison, people don't even talk about voting, about elections, not really, not the dudes you remember, because wasn't nobody black running no way. But your freedom hit just in time to see this brother has stepped in with the burden, with the albatross, willing to confess that he knew people like you. And you are free. And you are what they call out and off papers and living in a state where you're not disenfranchised. In prison, you listen to the ballot or the bullet and imagine that neither was for you. Having failed with the pistol and expecting the ballot to be denied. But nah. You found free and in line noticed that this is not like the first time you and the woman you married got naked and sweated and moaned and funked up a room not belonging to either of you. That lady is with you now and the kid is in your arms and you are wearing a Nat Turner t-shirt 
as if to make a statement at the family reunion. Everyone around you is black, which is a thing you notice. And you know your first ballot will be cast for a man who has the swag that seems inherited. It's early, but there's no crust in your eyes. You wanted this moment like freedom. You cast a ballot for a black man in America while holding a black baby. Name a dream more American than that, especially with your three felonies serving as beacons to alert anybody of your reckless ambition. That woman beside you is the kind of thing fools don't even dream about in prison. And she lets you hold your boy while voting as if the voting makes you and him more free. Sometimes it's just luck. Just having moved to the right state after the cell door stopped clanking behind you. The son in the arms of the man was mine and the arms of the man belonged to me. And I wore that Nat Turner t-shirt like a fucking flag. Brown against my brown skin. I should have read that yesterday. My wife was like, you don't have any happy poems. I think that's a happy poem. I should have read that one. Um, how are we on, we're going to do 20 minutes and leave 20 minutes. Um, it's exciting to be here, uh, with Dwayne and we've had, we've been in conversation a couple of times, uh, throughout the years, uh, Dwayne, um, we have similar research topics and, and so the book that I'm writing for New America is, um, intellectually related to, to the issues of incarceration and has threads of, of these issues in that. Uh, but it's a little bit different as it deals with slavery. But my dissertation, um, which is on its way to being done, it is we're going to get there February 1st and turn something in. There'll be words on a piece of paper. Um, is on the experience of people since juvenile life without parole. And so I spent a year going back and forth to Philadelphia. Pennsylvania has the largest concentration of former juvenile life or juvenile lifers um, in the world. Uh, the United States is the only country in the world on the books um, that sends uh, children to spend the rest of their life in prison. Um, and so I'm specifically interested in how uh, people sentenced to juvenile life without parole experience education while they're incarcerated. What does it mean to try to get a degree? What does it mean to, to read a book? What does it mean to write a poem? What does it mean to, to learn when learning is stripped of its vocational and social utility? Um, and when you are 14, 15, 16 years old and ostensibly told that you're going to spend the rest of your life in a cage. Like what, what motivates education in that context? And um, so reading this book and, and knowing Dwayne and, and his sort of his journey and his, his broader work, um, there are obviously a lot of sort of interrelated strains in that. And one of the things that um, is I find interesting and I find as a, as a tension is that so many of the people that I've spoken to spoke about um, specifically solitary confinement as a uh, transformative space in their individual educational journeys and that going to the whole something happened there either they met someone or the time in which they were alone and like could do nothing else led them to to books in many ways led them on a trajectory from illiteracy um, and motivated them to learn and gave sometimes gave them uh, an informal community of learning um, in ways that are that ultimately were really generative for their lives. Um, and the tension that I'm always feeling and trying to name is like, you know, you don't want so many people, and I think um, uh, so many people have written in their memoirs about that. So many people I've interviewed have talked about that, but I don't want to fall into the trap of making it seem as if like going to the hole is a good thing, right? And so, so even though solitary confinement is this space where so much transformation can happen, um, it is also a place of immense violence and psychological torture. And yeah, so I guess I'm thinking of I'm generally, how do you think of, do you, did yeah, yeah. you experience that tension? How do you think of like learning but I think, in those contexts generally? I think it depends though. And I think, um, and I bristle, like I, every time people, I call it prison cages too on occasion, but I bristle with, even when you say it's a cage, right? Mm -hmm. Because like, I know people that spend their whole life in prison. And you know, when you assert that it's a cage, also you assert that the other thing, like you say, there's no social or vocational utility to, to education, but it's immense social 
and vocational utility to education, even in prison. Like I am who I am because I was the person who was helping somebody get in a GD. Mm -hmm. I was the person who I wrote somebody fucking habeas corpus petition. Mm -hmm. I got I got myself out of prison 60 days earlier. I got them out of prison five years earlier. Like that is an immense social and, and motherfucker paid me. I mean, he paid me at oodles and noodles, but I ate well mm -hmm. for three weeks. Yeah. And so that is so I think one of the one of the challenges is that, you know, how do we think about incarceration in prison as something that's more complicated and nuanced and imagine how people that serve in time have had to think about. Mm -hmm. You know, if we decide that this is just a place, if we decide that it is just your approximation of hell, and it really is just folks' approximation of hell, because none of us have been to hell either, right? If it just becomes your approximation of hell, then there is no ability to think about it in any kind of rich way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I know a lot of somebody, I was listening to a podcast, but this, I'm not going to say the podcast, but I was listening to a podcast, and the guy was like, I went on a silent fast, and I went on a retreat. And I was like, that shit sound like the hole to me. Why is that not the whole? You went to a place that you paid thousands of dollars for. They gave you a small room to sleep in and told you not to talk to anybody. And he was talking about how this profoundly changed his life. And so it's not to say, I think we're afraid to say, like, I think we're afraid to talk about the freedom that comes with constraint, which is all a gazelle is. It's an enormous amount of constraint. You got to figure out what words rhyme would expect. When the last time that you listed a number of words that rhyme with any word? Right? Where's the light? Like, so even as a writer, the, the guzzle is an enormous amount of constraint. The sonnet is enormous. The, the last poem in the book is a crown of sonnets, which again is an enormous amount of constraint, but it's freedom in that. Doesn't mean everybody's going to access that freedom, but some will. And I think what happened, so, so for those people who, you know, told you those stories, I think maybe it was just like the space that was needed for them. But I don't know if we need to, one, generalize from their experience about what conditions of solitary confinement may do to people. Because like one of the things that comes with solitary confinement is all of the other variables about whether or not you could deal with the shouting, whether or not you could deal with the noise, whether or not you imagine the decision of being in a hole is some type of choice that you had some proximate control over, whether you checked yourself in a hole or whether you just able to abandon, like, you know, this is like one of the most frustrating things about prison is you sit there and you think, what if I just decide that I want to get out of this cell? What happens? Like literally, like what just happens if I just say, fuck it, I don't want to be in this cell no more. And you kick in the door and the door doesn't open. Like that's that's what breaks you, right? So it's not even just just like being in a hole that's the thing that happens. It's, it's, it's some people aren't equipped emotionally or intellectually to deal with what it means to just be absolutely deprived of, of those types of possibilities. The only time that I was in a hole that it really like fucked my head up a little bit. And the only thing that saved me was the dude beside me went crazy. And I was like, oh, fuck it, I'm good. Because I was like, you know, he did it for me. And I just don't want to deal with the shit that he's dealing with. And he said something. Though. He was like, it's in my poem. This fucked up. I just thought about this. But it's in that poem. When I said, um, this is all about me or something. You know, people be like, you know, some, some kind of saying that it's not, about, it's not about me, it's you or something like that. But he was like, it's not about you. And he was like, he was spitting on the door. He was throwing a chair. He got charged with assault for throwing a chair at the door. I don't know how, because the door was made of like steel. He got charged with assault for spitting, attempted assault for like spitting at the glass that the spit was not going to go through unless it was like syphilitic spit. And I still don't know if it would have worked there. But like watching this dude degenerate was like, oh shit, I'm good. This is somebody that's fucked up. And then what was crazy to me is the whole reason why he was degenerating though. It's because they tried to take in the population. Can you just and, explain what that means yeah. to folks who might not know? Oh, so he was in a hole because he had like checked himself in. And then he had caught a bunch of charges to stack up time so that he had to be in a hole for like longer and longer. And then all of that time had been served. And they were saying, now it's time for you to go to general population. It was a smallish prison. They didn't have a lot of cells in a hole. And they was like, we need this space for somebody who's actually a threat to the institution. And he just flipped and he snapped. And so he got this other series of charges. Um, but I was in the hole that time and I missed the Super Bowl. It was for some bullshit. Like I, I like gave somebody the finger and um, I didn't have to demonstrate in that way, sorry. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I told somebody, fuck you. I called this woman a bitch too. That's one of those things that I don't like talking about. This is the last time I called a woman a bitch, but we were in the, um, we were in the, pop, we were in, the uh, in the unit. And another reason why I don't like the word cage is because 
a lot of people live in dorms. And so we were living in a dorm. We were living in a barrack. And, and we were supposed to go outside. They didn't let us outside. And I was like, you forgot to let us outside. She was like, no, I didn't. I let you out. And I got mad. And I was like, bitch, that's why I don't like talking to y'all. And she was like, what you call me? And I was like, oh, shit. I called you a bitch. I was like, this is, <laughs> you know, and, then, and I was like, but I didn't mean anything by it. And I, and I walked away. And I told the other guy to let me out. He was like, no, we already opened the door. And I was like, motherfucker, you lying. And I just like tapped my finger up against the glass. And they said that they were afraid of me. And, um, and they made me go to the first unit manager and the guy didn't. He was like, this is bullshit. He sent me back, made them let me go outside. They waited to do left and called the next supervisor and said they were afraid of me. And they put me in a hole. And they gave me 15 days in solitary for calling somebody a bitch twice. And they gave me 15 days in a hole for giving dude the finger. And I, and, I, and I remember that experience because that hole was like, I had like 46 days before I went home. And I was just like, why the fuck am I in a hole? And it, the Eagles were about to be in the Super Bowl when Donovan McNabb and Terrell Owens. And I just knew they won. And, and they didn't. And I felt like it was my fault. But, um, and they just gave me a Bible to read. And I, I literally don't remember like day 17. I was like, man, shit. I was like, they got to let me out this motherfucker. Can you describe what? Solitary, to the best of your ability, to describe what solitary yeah. confinement is like. Because I've heard some people do this thing where it's, I imagine it's impossible to describe unless you've been there. And I imagine it's also different in different prisons and jails. But like some of my people say, like, lock, if you lock yourself in the bathroom maybe. for maybe. however I mean, long. And, yeah, maybe. Like, it's like, because it, it depends. Different prisons is different. Some prisons you're in a hole, <laughs> but you could, you could talk to people and you could see people and you could see on the yard and you could yell and talk to people on the yard. So in that prison, you know, you're still deprived of your freedom, but it feels like you can still be like, like connected to a community. Um, some prisons you're in a hole and you can lay on one prison I was in a hole for like six months. I could lay on the floor and talk to the dude beside me. And we literally like like told each other like our fucking life story. You talk for like three, four hours a day, laying on the floor, talking through a vent. Um, and so you like, can't see them when you're happy. You can't see them. But some prisons like the one I was at then, it was just like a really narrow pathway. The fucking window was up real, real high. You couldn't see through the window. And um, and that was like oppressive. And you could kind of yell out the vent or you could yell out the door, but you know, you didn't really know who you was talking to. So it kind of depends on what prison you were. I was at one prison where the door was so thick, they took your mattress every day. So you couldn't sleep throughout the days. And the door was so thick that you couldn't yell or talk to anybody. So you would and have the mattress right. at night. You have it. You have it from five o'clock on, and they so would they would take it, it at eight o'clock in the morning. So you couldn't like sleep during the day. Um, it depends. It depends on what institution you're at. How clean the hole is depends on what institution you, you're at. You know, uh, how often <clears> they let you take a shower. What it looks like when they let you outside for wreck. Some places they let you outside for wreck, and you sort of like in a in a dog kennel. Um, how long would you go? Three hours. You know, so you go out, you push up for three hours. Um, talk shit for three hours, whatever. So it depends. I mean, it was different from, from every institution. Um, but I remember all of them, though. I mean, you don't forget. You know, like, I, I remember every single fucking cell in the hole I was in. So you don't forget. So in that way, maybe it is, like, um, dangerously oppressive. But, yeah, and even that poem, Night, though, that's what the poem is about, too. It's like the, the challenge and the, the fallibility of, of somebody who's been in prison of their own memory of their experience because mm -hmm. you got to tell yourself a story about it that makes you okay anyway so mm -hmm. that story isn't necessarily true um yeah so that's one of the things i was going to ask next is in the book i think it's mostly all in first person and some of the stories are autobiographical and some of them are not like how did you think about what it meant to why how did you make the decision to make everything in first person even the stories that were not specific to your experience and was there like a fear around that right that like somebody oh well i would tell you one fear it was like this shit is real um and i was so glad that um the cat in the new yorker did this review before the book came out that i don't know this motherfucker and when he might be in this room right now i literally don't know don't know what he looks like and i'm glad though because he talked about this very thing and the reason why it was important is because you know like i ain't raped nobody i ain't sexually assaulted nobody I haven't, I'm, I haven't beat up my wife. I haven't tried to beat up my wife because I think she probably would beat my ass anyway. But, um, but like, and I've, I've, you know, and I drink, but like, I don't think I'm an alcoholic. Like, it's a whole lot of shit in here 
that I just think does not capture me at all. She say, why put it in the first person? It's because I got a really good life. And I feel like it's something obnoxious about me trying to tell all of these stories that I want to tell and constantly shifting those stories away from me. So then what happens is like, I get to be the hero of this narrative. And, and, and you read the book, and it's like, Dwayne is a great guy, but he knows some scumbag motherfuckers. You know, like, why does he talk about them? And, and I think, um, but also I think that like, we want to start these conversations that we don't want to have. You know, like, like, like I'm tired of people talking about mass incarceration. This shit is like, it's like boring to me now. Nobody talks about who should be in prison. Everybody talks about who shouldn't be in prison, right? But then some you get robbed or like your folks get raped or like, you know, somebody get the shit beat out of them or somebody get murdered. And then everybody wants to talk about prison now and it's okay for somebody to be locked up. But we never talk about it in, in the context of our own lives. And so the book was me like really contemplating just shit that I knew. And I remember sending one of the poems to poetry. I didn't even send the shit to get published, right? I have recorded it because I started to say poetry should live. And so the way to make poetry live is if I write something that I think is dope, I'll record it into this contraption that's like my cell phone, my camera, my video camera, my spy equipment, like it's everything, right? Um, I recorded it into this and I just texted to somebody. And I was like, yo, I was like, Don, share the fuck with this, right? And I, so yeah. poetry is poetry magazine. Oh, it's poetry is called poetry. Yeah. It's confusing because you're like, I sent it to poetry. And, it, like, real and people were like, this motherfucker <laughs> is crazy. He sent his poems to poetry? Did he send it to a sonnet or a haiku? <laughs> no, yeah, thank you. So, but I sent it to them and he was like, yo, this is dope. We'll publish it. And I was like, oh, I wasn't, the audio I sent the audio recording. And I was like, oh, that wasn't really, really why I sent it. You know, like, one, I feel like it's super unofficial. And then and, and two, I was like, ah. I was like, all right, fuck it. I'm excited. You know, publish it. So then I get an email back, and, I, and I'll read the last sonnet. I just not, I'm not going to read the whole poem, but I'll just read the last piece. Um, it says, um, and live without regret for your guilty pleas, shit. Mornings I rise twice, once for a count that will not come, and later with the city's wild birds who find freedom without counsel. I left prison with debts no honest man could pay. Walked out imagining I lacked my troubles. But a girl once said no to my unlistening ears, dismayed that I didn't pause. Remorse can't calm those evils. I've lost myself in some kind of algebra that turns my life into an equation that zeroes out regardless of my efforts. Algophobia means to fear pain. I still fear who knows all I've done. Why well, regret this thing I've worn, this sinner's bouquet, house shredded and torn. And so like they email me and it's like, Dwayne, I don't know if you know this, but it seems like somebody might've got assaulted in that last sonnet. And we just, and I was like, yeah, yeah. And I was like, yeah. And I was like, all right, we just wanted to make sure because, you know, seems like you assaulted somebody. And I was like, no, it doesn't seem like I assaulted anybody, right? And then I, and I'm writing an essay about this shit too. And then me and her had this conversation later. And I was like, you know, the real thing is you were saying, Dwayne, it seems like you wrote this poem in the first person. And I know somebody got raped in the last sonnet. And I kind of liked you, but now I kind of think that you're a bad person. And also, I want to give you the chance not to come out like that in our magazine, right? And I was like, well, I was talking to her. I was like, well, I didn't do it. But what does it mean to live in a society where a woman is raped as often as a woman is raped? And nobody talks about it ever in verse. And then when they talk about it, they always want to distance themselves from it because they want to make clear that they don't know anybody who does shit like this, right? And so the decision is, is that it was too much uncomfortable, messy shit in the book. And I was thinking about the book as a one-man show from the very start. And I was like, well, if it's a one-man show from the start, and if it's all these, these, these stories, I think it's apparent that all of them aren't the same person. But fuck it. Somebody read my last book and was like, and I, I had a line that said, I sold crack to pregnant women. And somebody, a reviewer, wrote a review and said, in this book, Reginald Dwayne Betts submits to selling crack to pregnant women. And I was like, well, what is it that made me want to defend myself so much? And I was like, oh, that's what makes us all want to defend ourselves. I Jeez. fucking hate dudes that sell crack to pregnant women. Right. They belong in prison. We all want people in prison. We don't ever want to say it. And, and, and so I was like, if I write this book, 
then I got to at least confront my own feelings about all of these things. And then maybe like end up in this situation where I'm having a public like conversation about it. I guess thinking about what are the, cause you read, so, you know, if you read this book and you don't know, and you have no Dwayne Best here to preface that like, this is not all autobiographical. Um, and I guess I'm thinking too of what this, what it looks like to, to write something like that in the first person in ever, but also in a Me Too era moment in which like people's thinking around how we collectively <coughs> reckon with the history of people who have harmed women um, and, and others, um, what that looks like and, and that there's no, and I don't, you know, did you ever think of putting an author's note? Did you ever nope. think or, or making clear that these were like either stories of other people or composites or were you just like, I am willing to accept that people may think that this is me given my, 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 the fact that you are writing a poem about prison and coming out of prison, that you, what you're, you wrote a memoir about being in prison. Like it's very much entrenched in your, your own narrative. Yeah. Um, like how do, you, how do you sort of hold those things together in the way that you were thinking about it? Or were you just like, I want it to be? Yeah. No, I mean, I, I guess I'm afraid for my, my children. You know, like I don't, you know, you know how they respond how they respond when they grown. I don't want them to think that like, I mean, they were like, damn, this motherfucker's a ninja. Like he was beating the shit out of mommy. How could we never heard them fighting? Like, how is this possible? Mm. You know, like I suspect that my kids, like even though I'm afraid of what my kids are think, I suspect that my kids would be like, nah, nah, mommy would have beat his ass. That shit did not happen at all. Like, so I, so in that front, I'm, I think I'm kind of clear. Um, my family, maybe I'm concerned, but I think they know me. But, uh, you know, fuck it. I mean, Were there I, conversations you had to have with your wife or your family before you made those nope. decisions? No, nah, I mean, I sent her the book. Like, you know, if you got time to read it, but um, if you don't read it, you don't read it. And I was, I was at a reading once and I started to read night and I was like, oh, nah, I'm not reading this in front of these people. It was a bunch of people from like, from my school and shit. And it was like a bunch of friends. And I was like, it was like at, at one of these dinners and I'm reading it. I'm like, oh, mm, I'm not gonna read that poem. But um, but no, nah, but then there's other poems though that I think strike some kind of balance. You know, it's like if absence was the source of silence, which is which is a poem about what it means to be raising sons and having to talk to my sons about the violence at the hands of men do. And that poem was born out of a real experience. I, I used to get on the train early in the morning to go to New York for work, and one morning I'm out. It's like three o'clock. I'm walking to the train station, and this woman saw me as I turned the corner with a Newport, and swear to God, it's like her whole soul jumped out of her body. And she ran into the street. And, and I was just like, you know? Um, and then the other part, and I say this because you know, I talked about it before. So the dad came home. Um, my how mom. Long, how long has it been now? 14. I got, came home March 4th, 2005. Not that I remember the exact date, but uh, so I guess it's been 14 years almost. And um, a little bit more than 14 years. But, um, the day I came home, my mom told me that she got raped, um, like a couple weeks after I got locked up. And I did my whole time, you know, fucking hating the system, like, fuck prosecutors, fuck the police, fuck the government, I'm a modern day slave, you know what I mean? I was like, on all that shit, you know, all the conspiracy theories. My mom was like, yeah, I got raped. And I live in a black community, you know, mm, some white people don't even come around the neighborhood. They just, they don't come around there unless they buying drugs. So I know who raped my mom, you know? And um, took her five years to go through the prosecution. Five years. Fucking public defender represented the dude. Say my mom was lying. My mom got raped at gunpoint. She runs into the middle of the street, right? My mom tells me the story years later. But the first time she just told me what happened, let it go. We didn't talk about it again for 10 years. So 10 years later, um, people asked me if I wanted to talk to my mom on a podcast. My mom wanted to be interviewed with me. I was like, why the fuck would my mom want to do that shit? No, she don't want to do that. But she's an adult, so I'm going to ask her, let her make her own decision, but don't expect too much. This was in a sex, love, and death podcast or whatever the hell it's called. So my mom says, yeah, sure. I was like, yes, okay. So she's like, should we prepare? I was like, um, no, no. So, I mean, what are we going to say? I was like, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I mean, she'll ask some questions, and we'll just, you know, we'll just play it by ear. 
So we go on. Lady asked my mom, how was it going to trial for your son? You know, your son faced a time in prison. My mom was like, well, you know, it was really difficult because at the same time I was going to trial for the person that raped me. I was like, wait, wait, huh? I was like, oh shit. So we talking about, damn. We, so we, we're going to talk about, you know, this is going to be on television and like, and so my mom is like, yeah, so we talked about it and she talked about the experience and how fucked up it was and also how fucked up the system was. It wasn't a single um, defense attorney she could call, not one, not no public defender, not no righteous, I'm against mass incarceration, motherfuckers ain't exist at all. And they always want to be super righteous. They want to like, they want to tell this story that like, they the defenders of the people. And I'm like, where was they when my mom got raped, right? And so, so then, so then I, I write this poem, or I'm trying to broach these questions. But part of the reason I'm trying to broach these questions is because what I know is that the dude that raped my mom raped two other black women. He went to prison. He was able to disappear, right? And ain't no real way to know what people locked up for. Was what, things separate from those? From no, it was separate from the rape or for the rapes. Yeah, yeah. And um, and then what I know is that he like a bunch of dudes that I did time with, a bunch of dudes that I did time with. So like I'm supposed to advocate for the decrease in incarceration, and I can't even have a conversation about what it means to like want to see somebody not in prison who's committed a sexual assault. And if I write about it, I'm supposed to like I'm supposed to be afraid about how you're gonna think about me if I write about this shit, but. I don't know. I just I just don't think that that should be my primary concern. I think that I got some other concerns, and I ain't even got shit anyway. Like, what the fuck it look like? What you want? Like, what, I'm not gonna be on the podcast. I'm not gonna be in your next magazine. You gonna put some Facebook posts about me because you think I raped somebody? It's like I don't even have shit for you to take from me, actually. So, so I felt like in writing a book, I was better off saying the shit that I needed to say and trying to say it in a way that provoked the conversation as opposed to trying to say it in a way they continue to kind of make me look like, I know who I am. And I, I'm certain that people who know me know who I am. And, and so I don't know, I, I just didn't, but I might just be really, really reckless though. And I might super regret this later on. You know what I mean? I might regret it later on, but on the front end, I was like, maybe I'm just gonna trust. I'm gonna trust that what I'm trying to do is create conversations. And, and, and I remember telling, and I talk about my mom now, but I only talk about it because she talked about it and I asked if I could talk about it. And I talked about it because I spent I spent a decade talking about um, mass incarceration and Annette spent five minutes publicly talking about what it meant to know that a black dude, like that, that this happens all of the time in our communities. It seemed like a woeful, woeful failure on my part to imagine a system without prisons and not, and not at the same time imagine a world without rape. And we not imagine a world without rape if we can't talk about it. And then if I, if the only way that I could talk about it is to situate it in somebody that we could mutually have discussed for, then I ain't really willing to talk about it. So, you know, for like three seconds or when people read the book, I don't know. I mean, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, but, but I think it's, it's more of a, I don't know. Before I turn it over to um, the audience, uh, I want to, I'm curious about, what were the, the texts and the writers and the books that were most formative to you while you were while you were away? Oh, while I was away, yeah. uh, Lucille Clifton, um, uh, who I wrote a piece about recently in the New York Times, um, Etheridge Knight, who I wrote about um, in my first book. My first line in my memoir comes from an Etheridge Knight poem, Aga mm Shahid -hmm. Ali, which is one reason why I really like the Carolyn Fouché, the um, the review that came out in the New York Times. Because I don't know her either, but she she just like peeped the connection between like me and Aga Shahid Ali because like all of my books have had guzzles in it. Um, um, Stein Steinbeck, um, Wyman, August Wilson. But you know, but I'm, I read man, I read this dude that wrote this book. Man, what's this dude man? He wrote a book called. Uh, I mean, I read everything, actually. You know, I read all kinds of stuff. I read stuff that I thought was great, stuff that I don't like now. Albert Murray, um, a, a, a Train Whistle Guitar was like a fantastic book. It had this line. It was like, her problem wasn't, her problem was that she didn't understand that being human meant she had to suffer like everybody else. I mean, that shit always stayed with me. Um, I don't know. I read The Past Time. 
I read the past time. I read to become a better writer, better thinker. Uh, At what point did you know when you were inside that you wanted to be a writer? Oh, I'm just, I'm ignorant, yo. I was when I found as soon as I got my sentence, because I was going to go to school for engineering. I was going to go to Georgia Tech and play point guard, and um, I had this shit mapped out completely, right? And I was I was a lineage. It was it was Kenny Anderson, it was Travis Best, then it was going to be me, like great Georgia Tech point guards. And um, and I got locked up. It was like I can't be an engineer from prison. I was like, so fuck, I'm gonna be a writer. And this was at the jail. I was like, fuck it, I'm gonna be a writer. Had no clue what that meant. Mm -hmm. The first book I read cover to cover was uh, A Lesson Before Dying mm -hmm. by Ernest Gaines. Like that I opened up and didn't start <coughs> finish reading until I was done. Uh, that shit profoundly changed so much about what I think. And um, and now I, I, I like profoundly dislike some things. Cause like how horrible must that be to say that like what you desire is to make a man go to the death to, to get yeah, executed about that, book. about that book. Like it's like profoundly disturbing now. Cause I'm like, no. That's not what I'm gonna do. We gotta get you off death row. We I don't know if I could accept that mm. as my responsibility. It is interesting to think about the books yeah. that you read that were like I've I've recently had some books that I've been thinking about that were incredibly formative to me that now I go back and look at and I'm like, oh, I don't know, man. That was, yes. that was I even even classic text, like even native son. Like, man, look, how you gonna kill the white lady by accident and kill Betsy on purpose? Like this shit has profoundly bothered me for like decades now, you know? Like, I just don't even understand. I don't understand how that worked. Like they turned to do criminal when it came time to commit violence against a black woman. The motherfucker was innocent. Like the shit that happened was an accident, right? He was innocent until it came time to murder a black woman who was riding with him. I don't know what the fuck she was thinking about anyway, but she riding. My bad. Yeah, no, that's that's <laughs> that's the summation of my, my tension with, with Richard Wright. Um, so let's open it up for folks who have questions. Uh, we do have people watching remotely, so please turn your microphone on. Oh, what we do? Yeah. <laughs> Aristotle, you got to cut your mic on though, for sure. Uh, my name is Aristotle Jones. I work for the Urban Institute in the Justice Policy Center. Um, and I know Dwayne kind of personally now, thank God. Um, but in her novel, Alice Walker, The Color Purple, she writes that time moves slowly but passes quickly. Can you um, tell us what have you learned through your time here on earth, not just in prison sentences, but you being a father, being a husband, being a writer, being a poet? What have you learned about yourself? What have I learned about myself? I think um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, man. That was like existential. Uh, what have I learned about myself? Uh, a long time ago, I, I thought, I mean, this is what I've learned about myself, actually. I thought that um, I thought I had all the answers, actually. When I was young, I was convinced that I had all of the answers. And I thought that I was better than everybody I was around who I expected to go to prison. And I expected, like, most of my friends to go to prison. Because we smoke weed, a lot of us sold drugs, there was guns around, I just expected people to go to prison. And I went to prison before everybody and it devastated me. And the one thing I learned about myself from that experience is, um, you know, what changed me is that I don't think I cared about people as much before then. And so maybe what I've learned about myself since then um, is that I care a lot about people and prison made me care a lot about people. Which is strange because it's like, you know, being super vulnerable you, you actually shouldn't care that much about other people. You should probably be more concerned with your own safety. But I do think over the time, and then that's the one thing that's followed me throughout my whole life, um, is that I care a lot about other people, or at least I, I try to. And, um, and the other thing, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I think that's it. Or maybe it's, it's, it's also, though, what I've learned is that um, so much of what we expect to be is, is, in my life at least, has been premised on what I've been willing to say that I expect to be. So when I decided to be a writer, I had no clue of what it meant to be a writer. But it was like I was in prison and I was so down that I could imagine something that I had no clue of if it was possible. When I came home, I realized that I allowed myself to be constrained in my ambition by my surroundings, even when my, sur my surroundings were academic institutions. So had you talked to me when I was living here in 2010, 2011, 
about law school, I'd have been like, I, I got three felonies. What I look like going to law school, even though I had been working on legal issues. The only thing changed when I ended up going to law school was that I was at Harvard Law School when I made the decision writing inside the law school. And I find it kind of disturbing because I would, I would think that we could become things without being proximate to them. But it was easy for me to imagine being a student at Harvard Law School. This is when you were on fellowship. This is when I, I was on fellowship at, at Harvard's Radcliffe Institution. And me and my man Uzo Awela used to go to the Harvard Law School's cafeteria to write because we didn't know anybody. And it was there that I decided to go to law school, but it was really only because I was there. And it was actually because somebody else had said that they got an MFA and then went to law school. And I was like, huh, you could do that? Oh shit, I'm going to law school. And I'm gonna go here, cause you go here, which should not be the way, it shouldn't be the thing that we have to see to make a decision. So those are the two things that in some ways I was more bold about what I was willing to dream when, I'm, when I was in prison than, than when I was free. I'm Gary Decker. I work for the Alliance for Youth Organizing, and I wanted to have a question for both of you to discuss. Um, Clint, I know you write a lot about imagining a world without prisons and prison abolition. Uh, and Dwayne, you uh, talked a little bit today about the necessity of prisons or that some people should be locked up. And I was wondering if both of you could talk a little bit about uh, if those futures are reconcilable, and if not, why? How much time we got, man? <laughs> um, what I'll say, I think something that's helpful to keep in mind is that abolition exists. Conceptions of abolition exist on a, on a spectrum, as many other things do, right? So even in the era of you know, antebellum slavery, different abolitionists had very different notions of what it meant to get to that point, right? William Lloyd Garrison had his own conception of like what it meant. Frederick Douglass had his own conception. Um, Nat Turner. Um, John Harriet Brown. Tubman, John Brown, you know, John Brown was like, all right, we're going to blow up Harper's Ferry, Frederick Douglass, you're trying to roll, Frederick Douglass was like, you crazy, I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. He asked Harriet Tubman, Harriet Tubman was like, I don't know you, what are you doing, this is a lot. So like, even, I think it's important to remember that like, when people, like abolition has different uh, connotations for different folks. And when I think of, I think of abolition as a, as a North Star. I think of it as like, what does it mean to build the sort of world in which prisons become increasingly and increasingly less uh, relevant to the society that we live in? Um, it, what does it look like to provide the types of jobs and social services and resources and healthcare and the sort of general society that makes it so that so many people's lives are not put on a trajectory in the first place that ultimately would lead them um, to exist within the carceral state. Um, and so it's more of a, a sort of paradigm of thinking differently about what type of world we have to build to make prisons less relevant and to diminish the power of prisons. Does that mean I don't, does that mean I think that there should not be a place where you put some people who represent um, an immediate uh, uh, threat to people's safety and people who have committed harm and, and represent continued threats to other people. Um, I do think that, one, I, my, I believe that one can be an abolitionist and still believe that there are institutions like that that should exist, um, but that's not what current prisons do, right? Like current prisons operate very differently. And, um, and, and it's tough, right? Cause like, I think issues of sex, sexual assault, domestic violence, uh, I mean, I, and part of what also I'm clear about is that like, I know if somebody ever did something to my kids, somebody ever did something to my family, I would want that, I would, in that moment, I would want that person to go to prison. I would want them to suffer. I would want them to hurt. I would want them to spend the rest of their life in a cage. I also don't think that, that my emotional response to harm that has been committed against people I'm proximate to is what should dictate public policy. I think there has to be, I think, and it's complicated, right? Like victims' rights are important, are also sometimes, depending on the state you're in, um, Dis I would say disproportionately informing what the sentence of someone will look like. And that's not to say that it shouldn't count at all, but it is to say how can we think holistically and maybe a little bit differently um, about the, the sort of entire thing. That's my one, two minute answer. Uh, no, I think I agree, but also, and I don't, I don't think I was making a case for the need for prisons. I think I was making, 
I was hoping that I was making a case for the need for a hard conversation about what we believe should happen in certain situations. I mean, the prisons that exist in the, most of the prisons that exist in the United States right now are horrendous and they are probably criminogenic just because of the, the conditions, the lack of resources, just because of the lack of resources for those who work in, in, in prison institutions. I mean, it's not like anybody goes to college and says, I wanna be a prison guard. Um, so I would say that like, maybe I was just saying a need to have a, a more complicated conversation and um, and the other thing though is I'm not sure if it's like so so like victims drive our responses to homicides mm -hmm. and they drive our responses to sexual assaults. But I'm not sure if I mean most of the people that's locked up probably had cases where the victim didn't show up at all. I mean you got a burglary case, you're going to jail, mm -hmm. and 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 a lot of people that end up going to jail aren't going to jail because of that one charge. They're going to jail because they had three charges before. And so I also think even though, you know, no, what has an outsized influence, and this was my criticism of, of like the whole notion of progressive prosecutor. Mm -hmm. It's like what has an outside influence isn't necessarily victims, but it's our fucked up statutory schemes. Mm -hmm. It's our laws. It's like the sentencing guidelines. Mm -hmm. You know, like if the sentencing guidelines like permit you to get 120 days for DUI, then you're going to get 120 days for DUI because you created a structure that says, listen, you could have got three years. I gave you 120 days. It looks like you gave this person a break. So I actually think that we we actually should be like more thoughtful about reconsidering what we conceptualize punish punishment as being. Right. And frankly, to say that like punishment or culpability shouldn't exist, which is often how we read the abolition conversation, it's like, well, you also can't deny me agency. Mm -hmm. Like I carjacked somebody. I also want to feel like I paid my due. Now we can have a better and a more uh, and a more um, adept. Um, we could be more adept at having a conversation about what does it mean to pay what you owe, mm -hmm. but we're not even having that, you right. know, so when we talk about abolition, and I do think it exists on a spectrum, but sadly, when we trying to enter, like um, AOC had a recent tweet, and she was like, and don't talk to me about violence, you know, we know violence matters, I was like, get the fuck out of here, you know, you having this whole conversation, and I haven't heard yet anybody talk about reforming the sentencing guidelines, I haven't heard anybody yet saying that the most profound problem facing prosecutors in the state of New York is that, or, or say, this, say, say um, Louisiana, because we mm -hmm. both know a little bit about Louisiana. The most profound problem facing prosecutors in Louisiana is that you could get 95 years for robbery. We don't need to talk about like abolition. We need to actually talk about why it's insane that you could catch a robbery beef and get 95 years in prison. And so why isn't the tweet about that? This is why I'm not a politician, though, because I'm thinking, <laughs> no, because no, because I'm thinking about my man is doing 37 years because he got four robberies in four different counties and he only got nine years for each robbery and he's still locked up. But Malvo is the case that we're hearing today. Malvo responsible for 12 murders, but in the same state of Virginia, a motherfucker that's doing like 60 years who ain't killed nobody can't get the lawyers that represent Malvo to represent him. And I know because I asked. I know because I tried, right? And so, you know, I don't know. Let's do uh, one last short question. Hi, my name is Nina Satija. Um, I'm a reporter for the Washington Post. Um, oh, wait. <laughs> I, I don't disagree with the thing you said earlier. That's all. Okay. <laughs> I totally get it. No offense taken. Um, you mentioned being you know, tired of the of the of this conversation happening around mass incarceration, and I think progressive prosecutors, and I totally identify with that. And I'm just wondering, what that's really what's dominating the media. I mean, that's what's being talked about, and this whole conversation of criminal justice reform is happening now on the presidential candidate level. But it doesn't feel like there's a lot of real like nuance to it or real meaning to it. And I guess I'm wondering if you can talk about that. And is it? Where, I've been watching. I mean, all sort of in a very yeah. I haven't heard the word. I mean, I've been watching all of the debates. California locks up more people than like any state in the country. Maybe Texas rivals California. I'm certain that the sentencing guidelines in California are just as atrocious as the sentencing guidelines in every state in the country. I think mm -hmm. they just changed them though. That, they didn't change. I'm, I'm certain that they didn't. Because I, I they've had like a huge drop based on this there was some supreme court case it was a it was a um it was a ninth circuit case that said that they had to reduce their prison population, their prison population. Right, right. and i mean but i would say this though what california has done though is that 
California has been the best state on like allowing parole for um, for juveniles mm -hmm. for all of the juvenile lifers, and then and then up in when people could get parole. So first it was like if you were juvenile, then it was like if you were 21, and I think now it might be if you were 25. 25. I think California has been great in doing that, but that's not a part of the presidential debate no. either. Yeah. So I, I guess I'm just saying I don't know if it's a if yeah. it's a I don't think it's a national conversation about the fact that we incarcerate too many people. Mm. And then even if we say we incarcerate too many people, it's definitely not a national conversation about the fact that it's too many people currently incarcerated. Like we are having a conversation about how one thing that could happen is in 1994 when Bill Clinton passed the crime bill, I mean, one of the things that they did was they linked the funding for building new prisons to truth and sentencing. And so you don't have a single presidential candidate saying, if I'm elected president, I'm going to find a way to incentivize states to bring back parole because I know one of the things that happened with the 1994 crime bill was that you had a massive amount of states across the country that got rid of parole in response to this nebulous, nebulous thing we call like truth and sentencing. So I, I just, I don't know if I would, I just don't know if I could honestly say that we're having a national conversation about mass incarceration. And so maybe what I meant is that I'm, I'm just frustrated and exhausted with a conversation about incarceration that doesn't seem to touch the lives of people I know, right? Yeah. That doesn't seem to touch the lives of dudes I know doing 30 years for robbery, doing 50 years for murder, you know, and these, and, or, or prisons I visit where guys is doing like, just like crazy numbers. It just doesn't seem to revolve around them. And I think what is true is that there is a disconnect between what actually, there, so the conversation, everybody's interested in mass incarceration now. And I think it is true that there is a disconnect between uh, the people's desire to want to end mass incarceration and like the actual and what that political conversation looks like and the actual like functional ways in which you would actually decarcerate which means you would have to let out a lot of people who ostensibly have committed real harm against other people um, and that looks like a very different conversation right like it's one thing if the mythology of like the nonviolent drug offender and Johnny John on the corner, like getting locked up for 25 years for selling weed, like that's a very easy palatable political narrative that like everybody can say like, this is wrong, This we're gonna end mass incarceration, make sure that kids selling weed, you know, aren't locked up for 25 years while medical marijuana is making millions and millions of dollars. That's true. That's also like a very small percentage of the conversation, right? Same thing with private prisons. Everybody's like private prisons, making all this money off of private prisons, people, you know, uh, making a profit off of people incarcerating people's bodies. It's true. It is egregious. It's also only 8% of all prisons in the country, right? So it's part it's of it. It's not is, like if you shut down private prisons, they letting them guys go home. Right. No, exactly. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe we just didn't, haven't heard that part. And I think that that, and I, and that's, I resonate with Dwayne saying, saying that piece about like the conversation has to be presented in a more complex way. If we are to be, if we, if you just want to let out people sentenced to nonviolent drug offenses, that's fine, but that's not ending mass incarceration. So if you want to actually end mass incarceration, if you want to move toward a society in which we don't have 2.2 million people in prison and jail, we don't have 11 million people cycling in and out of jail every year, um, we have to think very differently about, as Dwayne was saying, like what these long sentences are. Like should somebody, like I've, I spent the past couple of years with people, a lot of folks who like when they were 15 years old, they took somebody's life. Should that person spend the rest of their life in prison? And like, that's, that's the real question. Like, should that person spend the rest of their life in prison? Should they spend 20 years in prison, 50 years in prison, five years in prison, 10? I mean, so, and that's a conversation that like, is a, it's a political landmine. So people don't talk about it, but that's the only way that you actually move toward um, a decarcerated society. So I think we're all out of time. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, books are on sale. So if you you can't come and not buy decide, a book. Yeah, and if you decide to burn it, uh, at least buy it first. Um, <laughs> and so um, please join me in thanking uh, Dwayne and Kim for having us.